Okay, let's take our Bibles and look in Psalm 39, where we left off last time. This time my text is going to be from verse 7 down to verse 13. And I want to speak with you about the one and only hope. When you go out and talk to people, everybody has a hope. When you talk to them about heaven, you know, they'll tell you, no, they have a hope for heaven. For most, it's a hope so hope. I hope that when I stand before God that my good works will outweigh my bad. That's how a lot of people reason. And many have a false hope. In other words, their hope is not in the Lord Jesus Christ alone as he's revealed in the scriptures. And so there really is only one good hope that is revealed in the scriptures, and that is in the Christ of scriptures of whom we are reading and studying right now. And so David here in Psalm 39 and verse 7 knowing that he was under the heavy hand of the Lord in affliction and chastening, he says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. So here is the one and only hope. My hope is in thee. And based on that, then he Continues this prayer in verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. So even here in his affliction and chastening that he was under, he recognized that this was the hand of God. And so when he says, I was dumb... In other words, the Lord shut my mouth. I opened not my mouth, knowing that it was the Lord. And so he says, remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. There are a lot of people that think that whenever they face trouble, well, that must be the devil or some other thing outside of the sovereign hand of God. But we know that God is sovereign in all things and brings his children to see and know that whatever the affliction, whatever the chastening, that it is from God's hand. Here he talks about it being the blow of thine hand. I know today a lot of people don't believe in corporal punishment or correction. I was raised with that and uh, Whenever you got that correction, you knew that it was serious. And so here he says, I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. So again, this is a hymn here with a second part that ends with sila. And uh, this is where the music pauses. And there's time for reflection. You know, when everything is going well with man, he thinks himself to be someone. But all the Lord has to do is change one chemical in the brain and... uh, Man would be a blithering idiot. And so here David describes that. Whatever beauty that man thinks he has, and my how we like to strut around like peacocks and bring those feathers out and think we're somewhat. But when the Lord purposes to bring a sinner low, he says here thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. You might see a beautiful moth flying around, And yet, when the Lord takes away life from that moth, all it does is dry up and uh, break in pieces. And that's why he says, surely every man is vanity. Man in his best state is altogether vanity, is what the scriptures say. That word vanity means empty. 
you've heard that expression, someone's full of hot air. Well, that's what this word vanity means. That's all man is in his best state. And so he says here in verse 12, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. The New Testament says that there is no temptation that has taken any one of us but such as is common to man. I know when we're going through the trouble and the affliction under the hand of God, remember whom the Lord loves he chastens. Yet that's the time to remember that it's not just the Lord isolating us out, that anything that we have faced, even as David says here, as all my fathers were. You're not going to read in Scripture any trial or affliction that you're going through that has not already been recorded. I find a comfort in that, to know that when the Lord purposes to deal with us and not leave us alone. See, that's the blessing here that those he loves he chastens and scourges every son. The writer to the Hebrews says that if you don't face chastening, then he uses a strong word, are you bastards? That means that you're not one of his when God leaves you alone. You don't want God leaving you to yourself. Some people say that, I wish God would just leave me alone. You don't know what you're asking. Because for God to leave a sinner alone means leaves him in his hardness. That's how he hardened Pharaoh's heart. It says Pharaoh hardened his heart, but it also says God hardened his heart. Well, how did God harden his heart? Left him to his own desires and his own will. That's why David says here, Oh, spare me, verse 13, that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. So what he's describing here in these verses 7 through 13 is the one and only hope. But as we considered last time, as with all the Psalms, yes, we can look at this from David's experience, but we also want to see how our Lord Jesus Christ himself endured chastening, the chastening of his father. David is but a type of our Lord Jesus Christ in his humiliation as the God-man. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came and under the heavy hand of his father was completely cast upon his father and uh, therefore hoped in his father as the Lord that the father would hear his cry and that his hope would be entirely in the father to deliver him through his humiliation and through his affliction that he endured. We've been studying this throughout the Psalms. Psalm 22, particularly as we studied it, shows us the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ as a man under the hand of his Father. We saw last time in Isaiah 53, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So I want us to go back over these verses here, verses 7 through 13. Yes, we can study it from the perspective of David as a man, but in doing so, if we don't see how Christ himself fulfilled these scriptures, then we've missed the very purpose of these scriptures. The question may be asked, well, did the Lord Jesus Christ possess faith and hope? And the answer is clearly yes, because when the Lord Jesus Christ came, it was necessary for him as a man to work out that righteousness necessary to the satisfaction of his father that when he finished the work and laid down his life, that God would then impute righteousness to those for whom he came as the representative. And what's our biggest sin? Unbelief. That's why it was necessary that Christ believe in every aspect of the law and the word 
on behalf of that people that he represented. I don't know if you stopped to think about that. It was necessary that Christ be that faith to stand in the place of our faithlessness. Because when you consider how many days and how many times we are faithless, so where's the hope? Well, the only hope, the one and only hope is in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the New Testament writes that we are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Be careful that your translation says that. It's not we're justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not what it's saying. But justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. That means that it required him to be the justifier to have that faith that perfect faith that we don't have before God the Father. And the same with hope. It was necessary that Christ perfectly hope in his Father. Why? Because he was representing sinners who do anything but hope. And if you ever get thinking that somehow you've got it figured out, well, all the Lord has to do is shake your world a little bit or shake mine. And when the winds begin to blow, that's where we realize that we don't really have faith. And uh, our hope is anything but stable and solid. It takes the Lord by his spirit to draw our eyes again unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want us to see here in this portion, that Christ being the fulfillment of everything that David was as a type. Because we know that even David failed in many of his words here and crying unto the Father was because of his own weakness. Yet our Lord Jesus Christ in crying unto the Father, yes, he was made weak in the flesh, and yet his hope in the Father never wavered in that faith that was necessary to the satisfaction of God the Father he fulfilled. Oh, what a blessed thought to consider that. If you look over with me in Hebrews chapter 5, You'll see how the writer to the Hebrews puts it here. It says, and this is Christ as the high priest, the representative of God's elect. In Hebrews 5 and verse 6, it says, As he hath also in another place, as he saith, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He wasn't after the order of Aaron. That priesthood had to go away because it was weak in that it could not bring salvation. Christ was established after the order of Melchizedek. Aaron was of the Levitic priesthood, the Levites. But Melchizedek, this is the one that came out to meet Abraham after he came back from delivering Lot and his family from the enemy kings. And the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And he was the one who came and met Abraham, but he didn't have, there's no genealogy. When you go back and study, who was Melchizedek? People try to figure it out. I believe it was none other than Christ appearing in the flesh before he came in the flesh, one of those pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. And so that's why here it says that he was established as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That means his priesthood can never change. All those other priests that came before him, they had to go away because they could not bring in salvation. But don't think for a minute that when the Lord Jesus Christ came to work out salvation, that somehow he was floating through life as the Redeemer and not affected in any way by the effects of the contradiction of sinners against himself. Here in verse 7 of Hebrews 5, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, Though he were a son, the eternal son of God, yet 
What did he do? Learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And here's an amazing thing in verse 9. And being made perfect. You say, well, I thought he was perfect already. Yes, as, the, as God in his divinity he was perfect. But as a man, he had to come and work out that absolute perfection whereby upon completion of his work, God would then justify, declare righteous the people that he came to represent. And that's why it says there he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Yes, it was purpose from eternity, but it was necessary that he come in the flesh and that he work out this salvation in the flesh and that in every way he be tried and tested and tempted and that in his response to every affliction it be nothing but perfect faith and perfect hope in his father that's what was necessary for him to be the redeemer and the savior you notice back here in psalm 39 when David spoke in verse 12 and said, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Well, that's the same language that's used over here in Hebrews 5 and verse 7. That he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying. And it says, and tears. What were those tears? He was called the man of sorrow. It wasn't for any sin in himself. He had none but that sin that was laid upon him. He cried these tears where we don't. Can you imagine? I've often said that if God were to require nothing else but repentance on our part and that we would own our sin and know it to be what it is before God in order for that to be our salvation, none of us could be saved. Oh, there's times when we cry and we shed tears, but it's over the consequences. Sometimes we'll get upset over this sin or that, but to see ourselves as wretched sinners, that's something that is not part of our being. But here's the Lord Jesus Christ who was without sin and yet being the substitute and taking this upon himself, cried unto his Father. Here in verse 12, David says in Psalm 39, hold not thy peace at my tears. This is why I say that David is speaking here as a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he would have endured. And the way it's written there in Hebrews 5 and verse 7 when it says he had offered up, that means that this was every bit a part of Christ's substitution and the offering of of himself unto his father as the Lamb of God. That it was these supplications and tears and the bearing of the sin of his people. It wasn't for himself that he supplicated his father, but he offered up these prayers and supplications as being that sin offering unto his father whereby God would be satisfied, just like David is asking there. When you hear that in verse 12, and all the way down through here, think of Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17, that he cried unto his Father, he prayed unto his Father, on behalf of that people that the Father gave him to save. None of us can ever really truly know the weight of sin. Oh, we say, sometimes we shrug our shoulders and we say, well, we're all sinners, aren't we? Well, that's, that's not understanding the weight of sin. Understanding the weight of our sin is to see what Christ himself endured to save such wretches as we are. He knew the true weight of sin, though he was sinless, and I must insist on that, he never became a sinner. He bore the sin of that people that the Father laid upon him. And oh, how great was the weight of that sin. If we want to understand just how great is the justice of God, well, we can go back and look and see how God 
destroyed the world in the days of Noah and saved only Noah and his family. We can go back and look how he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And we can look and see over the history of Israel how the Lord brought judgment into the land and many were slain and taken away. All these are manifestations of God's wrath. But to truly see what was necessary for Christ to be the sin bearer and what is the weight of our sin if Christ died for us. Look at what he endured not only in his life as the substitute as we see here crying with supplications and tears and that it says in the days of his flesh a lot of people think well that was just in uh, the garden before he went to the cross no it says there in the days of his flesh that would mean then from his conception all the way to the cross what he endured in the days of his flesh many times we read in the new testament that he went aside and spent the night in prayer unto his father. You say, well, what was he doing in prayer? We can't even endure 15 minutes. The disciples, even on the eve of the cross, when the Lord said, watch and wait, they couldn't wait with him an hour. He found them asleep. But yet our Lord never slept. Everything that he did in the days of his flesh were represented here in his crying and tears. Strong prayers is the way it's put there, with strong crying and tears unto his father. When he said that he, he cried unto him that was able to save him from death, it doesn't mean there that he was seeking to avoid death or that he would be saved from dying. That's not the sense there. But the sense is saved through death, that after all was said and done, Everything about Christ would be in accord with him being that perfect lamb without blemish and without spot before his father. And that as a result, to be saved from death means to be delivered from death, to be raised again from death. And it says he was heard in that he feared. That word feared doesn't mean there to be afraid. There is no way that Christ trembled as a result of facing the cross or being carried away through his sufferings and trembling out of fear. No, this here has to do with reverence for God. And such was the, again, hope that Christ had in his Father that when he had finished doing all that the Father required of him, that the Father would hear him and did hear him. And so coming back to my text here in Psalm 39 and verses 7 through 11, as I said, here David's hope in the Lord when he says, Now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. All the way down to verse 11 that we read, we have a picture of what would have been Christ's hope in his Father under the affliction of sin. David was being afflicted because of sin in him, but the Lord Jesus Christ had no sin in him. His affliction was due to sin being put upon him. I want you to see that clearly because there are some that are preaching and saying that when Christ identified with sinners, that he actually became what we are. In other words, when Paul wrote there in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 that he was made sin. They'll say, well, there it is. That means he was made a sinner. No, there's a word in Scripture for sinner, but that's not the word that Paul uses there. What he uses is the word for a sin offering. He was made a sin offering. And Isaiah 53 describes how it was that he was made sin. It says here in verse 5 of Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. So when his suffering unto death under the hand of God 
occurred, it wasn't because of any of transgressions in himself. He was bruised for what? Our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was what? Upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And that, in that sense, he was made to be the sin bearer. Over in verse 6, see, here's the difference. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. That's all that can be said of us. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's why I said that if we were to be judged just on our believing, that somehow that is what is going to give us right standing before God, there's none that could be saved. Because we have all gone astray, turning everyone to his own way. That's what sheep do, by the way, if you've ever watched them for long. If there's no shepherd, they're going to go wander every which way they can. That's our nature. But it says, the Lord hath what? Laid on him the iniquity of us all. It doesn't say the Lord hath put in him the iniquity of us all. No, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I think it's just absolutely abominable even that I have to take time to make that clear. But you're going to run into those out there that are preaching this. As I was shocked to learn many years ago when uh, I was told by some that I had been associated with that no, that's what they believed was absolute substitution. Christ became what we are. In other words, he was made a sinner by the sin that he bore so that we are made what he is. In other words, perfect righteousness. Well, that's far beyond what the scriptures declare. And uh, what it's saying ultimately is God would then have accepted a corrupt sacrifice. Christ in no way was corrupt to be the fulfillment of that Old Testament type of the perfect lamb without blemish and without spot. It was necessary that he be without blemish and without spot. And particularly in this matter, not just in the negative in that he bore the sin, but in the positive that he offered up unto his father that perfect hope and that perfect faith and that perfect trust which is necessary for us. He hoped in our place if he died for us. He trusted in our place if he paid our sin debt. But here, coming back again to Psalm 39 and verse 7, we find David expressing this very hope that it wasn't in himself. When he says in verse 7, my hope is in thee. That's a very clear statement to show that salvation is outside of ourself, that it is in another. And that's what faith is. Faith has an object that when God grants faith to sinners for whom Christ paid the debt, that means that their eyes are turned upon Christ who was faithful. There's no faithfulness in us. And there's no hope in us there's no righteousness in us, so that hope of salvation must be in another. That's why David says here, my hope is in thee. But it took the Lord himself hoping in his Father on behalf of that people that he came to save. Now some might question in verse 8, since we're looking at David here in Psalm 39 as a type of Christ, when David says, deliver me from all my transgressions, well, we know David was a transgressor. And so his hope and deliverance outside himself would have been in the Lord Jesus Christ who would come, live, and die, and rise again on his behalf. But in what sense could Christ himself have prayed to his Father, deliver me from all of my transgressions? Only by imputation. That is, when the Lord took on him the sin of that people that the Father gave him, he owned those sins as being his, in other words, for the purpose for which he was dying. 
again when he was a substitute and that sin was laid on him, that would be the sense in which he would say, deliver me from all my transgressions. All these transgressions that he owned as the substitute, not being a transgressor himself, but that by his faithfulness and uh, his faithfulness unto death, that when he had given up his life to his father, that the transgression would actually be removed. So that when Christ died, those transgressions were removed. He was delivered from those transgressions. He's not now the sin bearer. A lot of people think that somehow he rose and ascended in heaven, and now every time one of his children sins, that's Christ now leaning over and kind of saying to the Father, well, I paid for that one too. No, there is no more transgression. Christ either put it away or he didn't in his death, and we know he did, otherwise God the Father would not have raised him from the grave. When you read over there in Romans chapter 4, for example, this is important to see. How was Christ delivered from the transgression that was laid upon him? Well, when he died, it was put away. There was nothing more that was necessary to satisfy the law and justice of God. I know there's some, because of tradition, they say that from the cross, then he went into hell and somehow endured more suffering there, preaching to the souls that were in hell, and then finally was delivered. No. Everything, when he said at the cross, it is finished, it was finished. When he bowed his head and gave up his spirit to his father, it was finished. There was no more transgression for which he would then be responsible as the substitute. It was put away. Here in Romans chapter 4, we see that in verse 25. Who was delivered... For that word for is on behalf of or because of our offenses and was raised again there again the same word for because of our justification that means when he raised again the justification was accomplished if you ask me or even ask the scriptures when were sinners justified before God it's when Christ died I know there are a lot of people today that think it's when you believe, then you're justified. And they make their believing to be the cause of God justifying them. Well, that would be impossible because our belief is faulty. Now, here's where justification took place. When Christ was delivered, notice, for, on behalf of or because of our offenses, then he was raised again because God was satisfied. That's what justification means, satisfied. So that when the Spirit of God then comes and reveals Christ in the heart, our eyes open to Christ, it's not then that we're justified. It's then that we see that when Christ died, we were justified before God. So David here, in praying, deliver me from all my transgressions, Make me not the reproach of the foolish. How Christ would have prayed that was simply that the Father would acknowledge his work on behalf of transgressors. He was numbered among transgressors. And that the reproach of the foolish, that were those that mocked him, that saw him hanging on the cross and said, oh, he saved others, let him save himself that he not be given over to their reproach. And again, it shows us just to what extent our Lord Jesus Christ cried unto his Father. Because some will say, well, he knew what the end would be anyway, so it wasn't really that big a deal. He was addressing his Father as a man, every much so as if he were not God, completely cast upon his Father to hear him and to accept his offering on behalf of his people. That's why we read there in Hebrews in chapter 5, it says, though he were a son, yet what? Learned he obedience. It was necessary for him to earn and establish that righteousness that God might be 
just to justify. And so, even as David is praying in verse 10 that the stroke be removed from him and that he was consumed by the blow of his hand. You talk about being consumed. This is the language that was used of Christ. You think about that burnt offering in the Old Testament. It was completely consumed. Nothing left. The entire offering burnt up with the fire. Well, that's a picture of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He endured what no man could endure. And yet it was necessary that he be that complete sacrifice, burnt offering before the Father, in order for that stroke to be removed. Here, David in verse 10 is praying for his own situation at that time. But ultimately, where was that stroke removed from David? How was it that God's consuming hand was taken off of him? It's when Christ died. Because when Christ died, it wasn't just for those of the New Testament. It was for every one of those in the Old Testament that the Father had given to the Son and for whom he came. Remember, they lived under God's forbearance. But there was no re redemption. There was no justification until Christ came and paid the sin debt. That's what we read over here once again in Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, what his death required, his death as the testator required. It says in verse 15 of Hebrews 9, for this cause he was the mediator of the New Testament why is it called the New Testament? Well, it was fulfilled. It was newly fulfilled. Every jot and tittle of the Old Testament fulfilled in, in his death as the mediator. But it says that by means of death, and that's what it required, it's not just the shedding of blood, but the shedding of blood unto death. He shed blood when he was circumcised. He shed blood when they whipped him with uh, the whips before they took him to the cross. He shed blood when... The crown of thorns was placed upon his head. But none of that would have been satisfactory blood shed. The satisfactory blood shed was unto death. The wages of sin is death. It required the death of the substitute. But notice here in verse 15, when he died, yes, it was the New Testament, but it says, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. That means that Abraham and, and David, as we're reading about here, Jacob, these, when they died, they died awaiting their redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people ask the question, well, did they just go to heaven then unredeemed? They didn't go to heaven. In the Old Testament, you'll find that the place of the dead was called Sheol. And that's where everybody went, whether they were redeemed or not. It was one place of the dead. Christ spoke of that in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where both went to the place of the dead, but there was a great gulf fixed between them. That's the way it was before the cross, before Christ died. But when he died and rose again and ascended on high, he took with him. That's what Ephesians 2 is all about. We were all raised with him. I'm not there right now physically, but when he raised, I was raised already. And my redemption was accomplished when he died and rose again. That's what it's talking about here. All that was in the Old Testament were types and pictures and shadows, but none of that could redeem. None of that could put away sin. It was necessary that Christ come and that here it says by his death it be for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament that here made his beauty to consume away like a moth. That's why when people saw Christ hanging upon the cross to them he did not look like a savior. It, take, it took the eyes of the of the spirit given to that one thief there on the cross to see him 
as not only the Savior but the King, but as a man to look upon him, even as Isaiah said, there was no beauty with which to behold him. And I think of Job even under his chastening, withering away to where even when his friends came to see him, they were appalled at his appearance. Such was the heavy hand of God upon him. And so this is what David is saying. If the Lord were to lay his heavy hand on any one of us to the point of not showing mercy or grace, it would most definitely consume any one of us away. It, we've all had examples of that, of loved ones that have been in perfect health, and then the Lord strikes them with a disease, and over time you just see that disease eating them away, and uh, finally, ultimately, taking them from this life. So here, as far as David being a representative of our Lord Jesus Christ, it shows us to what degree he suffered, and yet he did so in silence before his father, knowing that his father did it. And that's really what the word Selah is about in verse 11. Think of a hymn that's being sung here, and then all of a sudden now there's silence with the music. And then it picks up again with verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. I'm thankful that God did hear the prayer of his son. And uh, that if he heard David's prayer, it was only for Christ's sake. It was because he was one that God the Father had chosen and uh, had uh, given to his son. And by his spirit was drawing him uh, to himself feeling much as a stranger. But I noticed in verse 12 when it says, it doesn't say, for I am a stranger from thee. No, he says, I am a stranger with thee. I love that. Because no matter how we may feel estranged many times in this life, yet we're never alone. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what I will fear no evil for, thou art with me. Just like the father when was enduring what he endured because of the transgressions of his people, he was never alone. The father never turned his eye away from his son. I know there are some that even say that of Christ, that God the father turned his back on his son. He never did. It was necessary that the eye of God the Father be on Christ from conception all the way through the cross because the Father was observing him and requiring of him that perfect righteousness necessary to impute to his people when he had finished the work. And yet he was never alone. So even Christ could say, in that state, of the days of his flesh. He was a stranger, yes, he was estranged, if you will, from that glory in heaven, and yet never alone. He was a sojourner, but he came to identify with that people. And when he says, oh, spare me that I may, he was spared not from death, but spared through death. And uh, when he says, before I go hence and be no more, that was a language that even Christ used that he said he would go away and not be seen anymore. And uh, people began to question, well, where's he going? They didn't know that he was speaking of going to the cross, first of all, but then ultimately going into heaven. But when he went into heaven, we see him no more, and yet he's ever present with his people. And in that we live in that hope that one day he is coming again and that even though we may die and these bodies be buried that we will be resurrected in that final day as John wrote in his epistle it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is 
Well, I hope this is helpful. This is the one and only hope for sinners. It's in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he indeed be our hope. Amen.